All right, thanks, Mike. Our last speaker today is uh, Nigel Stippa, who is a medical student coming from uh, Long Island. And he will be talking to us about OCT and the optic nerve. So go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? So again, I'm going to be talking about the role of uh, optic nerve OCT in the evaluation of central retinal vein occlusion, but my talk is going to be a little different from the other two talks, as uh, I'm going to kind of be talking about the usefulness of the optic nerve OCT uh, in light of an interesting case. Um, so let's get started. Sorry about that. All right. So the patient is a 64-year-old Caucasian female with a history of type 2 diabetes and malignant right breast melanoma, complaining of blurry vision for about one week and left-sided headaches for a month that ranged from 2 to 9 out of 10 in severity and was worse in the evening. Um, it seemed to have an insidious onset as she, she noticed that she had some blurring of her vision and she um, you know, covered her right eye and kind of noticed that she had very, very, very little vision um, in the left eye. And she reports no other symptoms, no <coughs> systemic signs, no fever, no jaw claudication, no um, myalgias, and no other ocular sim symptoms, no foreign body sensation, no pain of the eye, uh, just, uh, just the headaches on the left side and the blurring of vision. Now, given her uh, recent history of uh, malignant melanoma, it's important to note her timeline. Uh, Eleven months prior to presentation, she had, she had surgical resection for a right breast melanoma, was found to have positive sentinel lymph nodes, and consequently interferon therapy was initiated. Uh, three months prior to her presenta presentation, the interferon therapy was discontinued, secondary to severe weight loss and alopecia, and at that time, a PET scan was negative for metastatic disease. Just to give a little more history, she has uh, no significant ocular history. She's allergic to codeine. Uh, she takes metformin and a multivitamin. Her father had type 2 diabetes and died at 68 due to an MI. Mother had breast cancer and died at 86. And there's no significant ocular family history. And of note in the social history, she has been smoking one pack per day for the past 35 years. So on exam, uh, her visual acuity, acuity in her right eye was 20-20 and hand motion on the left. There was also an APD present on in the left eye. Uh, the pressure in both eyes bilaterally was normal. Her color vision was undetectable OS, um, and the visual field was unobtainable. The right eye was normal. Both eyes had full uh, motility, and the slit lamp exam was within normal limits on both sides, except for um, the posterior exam. Uh, so the dilated fundus exam on the left showed uh, significant disc edema, some scattered hemorrhages throughout the posterior pole, while the right eye was normal. And I left out the stage because as a teaching point quickly, I'd like to uh, go through the Frisson scale, which uh, grades disc edema. Um, so I've listed a couple characteristics for each stage, but I um, bolded kind of the important points to quickly determine the stage of disc edema. So stage one is characterized by uh, obscuration of the nasal border of the disc, and you can see that uh, in this picture, that um, the nasal border is obscured while you maintain the superior temporal and uh, inferior border of the disc. Stage two is similar in that you have an obscuration of all the borders. Stage three, um, you have an obscuration of one or more segments of a major uh, blood vessel as it's leaving the disc, and that's kind of important to identify in this stage. You can see uh, the vessels on the disc, but as you note right here, that there's an obscuration of one of the major vessels as it leaves. Stage four is characterized by uh, total obscuration of the discs of the vessels on the disc margin, and near total obscuration on the uh, disc surface. And then five is simply just uh, total obscuration of vessels uh, on the disc surface. So now that we've gone through uh, the scaling, let's go. B uh, let's look at the fundus photos of our patient. And so, how would you? classify that. So, let's 
stage five because all the vessels are obscured. And as you can see, um, the disc edema uh, put together with the hemorrhages scattered all over the posterior pole that this patient's presenting with a CRVO. Um, now given the you know, page patient's age and the fact that she has diabetes mellitus, it's, you know, it's not surprising that she may um, present with a CRVO. Other factors that can contribute include hypertension or a hypercoagulable state, hyperlipidemia, uh, inflammatory conditions, or a tumor. Um, so her age is significant, uh, but her diabetes uh, mellitus was actually pretty well controlled. Um, so in light of that um, and her OCT, this is the OCT of the uh, optic nerve head of her right eye, and these two images below is the OCT of the optic nerve head of her left eye. And you can see the significant disc edema in both images, um, but what else do you notice uh, in the lower two images? Um, of note, if you look at the RPE in the uh, normal right eye, you can see um, how it's kind of um, deflected downward in the normal position, almost in a V-shape that's pointed away from the vitreous here. Um, whereas in the uh, left eye, the RPE is kind of um, deflected towards the vitreous, at least on this side. And you can kind of see it here in this other image. And uh, Patrick Sibony, uh, the chairman at our home institution um, and neuro-ophthalmologist, has um, recognized this kind of pattern in patients that have intracranial hypertension. And so he hypothesized that um, the intracranial hypertension can be manifest as a deflection of the sclera that can be um, assumed to also be seen in a deflection of the RPE. Um, so you have this, he hypothesized that you have this trans laminar pressure gradient um, in uh, combination with a, uh, causing a deformation of the sclera and that's a deformation of the RPE. And so Dr. Sibony uh, utilized geometric morphometrics and SDOCT to compare the uh, peripapillary retinal pigment epithelium Brooks membrane shape in eyes with papilledema, eyes with anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, and normal eyes. Here again, you see um, you know, a normal, normal eye, the normal position of the RPE Brooks membrane. And so he looked at 30 normals, 20 eyes with AION, and 25 with papilledema, papilledema and intracranial hypertension. So as I said, he utilized a technique called geometric morphometrics. It's an analytical technique to quantify and statistically analyze the shape of biological forms. So he <coughs> used 20 equidistant semi-landmarks um, and digitized them onto the OCT images of the RPE and Brooks membrane, spanning 200 microns on each side of the neural canal opening. And uh, data, data analysis was performed using uh, standard geometric morphometric techniques, including a uh, generalized least squares procrustis superimposition, which in layman terms, <coughs> Um, kind of superimposes the um, multiple images. A principal component analysis, which can determine how close or how um, different the, the shape is, and thin plate spleen, which is kind of a, is a smoothing program. And so he found a statistically significant difference between eyes with um, intracranial hypertension and papilledema and eyes with AION and the normal eyes. So the peripapillary retinal pigment epithelium of normals and eyes with AION displayed that characteristic V-shape directed away from the vitreous, and that's what I'm talking about here. Whereas the peripapillary RPE of eyes with papilledema have an inverted U-shape inward toward the vitreous, um, which is what our uh, patient displayed. Um, and of significance is that there was uh, no significant difference between normals and, and AION, and this is critical. Um, so what that means is that the disc edema alone is not enough to explain the uh, change in shape of the RPE. Uh, and then in select cases of papilledema, the pre- and post-treatment OCTs demonstrated a change from that inverted U-shape associated with intracranial hypertension to the characteristic V-shape associated with a normal pressure. So um, A uh, shows the points um, the semi-landmarks uh, um, that were superimposed on the OCT from the three groups. So the blue represents the points um, from the patients with papilledema, the black represents the points of the normal eyes, and the, blue and the red represents the points uh, of the eyes with AION. 
And so you can already start to see that there's this um, one shape for the blue, which is the eyes of papilledema, and the other normal shape for the normal eyes in the eyes of AION. Um, and then B just takes the, the means for each group and then C uh, draws a line through each point. So you can kind of see um, the, uh, the two different RPE shapes, the blue one associated with papilledema and intracranial hypertension. Um, the red and black are the normal and the AON associated with no intracranial hypertension and hence the normal shape. And then here's one of the patients um, with papilledemia. Uh, we have a pretreatment and a post-treatment OCT. And so you can see uh, the deflection of the RPE in the eye, and both eyes with uh, intracranial hypertension, papilledema. And then two days later, it's not quite back to normal, but you can see um, two days after um, an LP, with the normalization of the pressure, you can see a, um, a flattening of the RPE that's getting closer and closer to that normal V shape that we saw. Um, so he went one step further, and he looked at the shape of the peripapillary RPE in eyes with presumed optic nerve sheath meningiomas um, versus normalized using a very, very similar technique. Now, I, um, they're, no, they're uh, denoted presumed based on um, clinical data and MRI data. Um, but he looked at 30 normals and 10 patients. Um, so there were 11 eyes with presumed optic nerve sheath meningioma because one of the patients actually had bilateral involvement, uh, interestingly. And he performed a similar shape analysis using the SDOCT and the geometric morphometric techniques. And he also looked at other variables, including tumor size, proximity to the globe, age, and the thickness of the retinal nerve fi fiber layer. And he found very similar results, that there was a, indeed a statistically significant difference in the shape of the RPE between nearly all eyes with presumed optic nerve sheath meningioma and normals. Um, now, the shape was statistically different, but in this case, the shape ranged from that inver inverted um, U to a kind of a flattening of the regular um, V shape of the RPE. And that makes sense because there was, you know, the, the tumor sizes were different and the proximity to the globe was different. Um, and they found that the greatest deformation was associated with meningiomas abutting the globe, but they also saw deformation um, among patients with the tumors remote from the globe. Um, however, patient 11 displayed no apparent deformation, but this kind of makes sense because that patient had the smallest tumor and that tumor was the furthest from the globe, so um, and then they, they found a correlation of 0.75 um, regarding the size and proximity of the tumor to the globe. Um, so they concluded that similarly to the um, eyes with papilledema causing that deformation of the RPE, that a tumor of the optic nerve sheath can kind of cause a local increase in pressure and cause a pressure gradient, um, translaminar pressure gradient that can cause a deformation of the sclera and thus a deformation of the RPE. So if we go back to our patient, um, MRI of the brain and the orbits revealed a six millimeter lesion in the right frontal lobe, an extensive tumor involving the left optic nerve sheath that was hyper intense on T1. Um, so the top, top uh, differential is uh, a brain met in addition to a uh, meningioma of the optic nerve sheath. However, meningiomas of the optic nerve sheath typically are um, iso-intense on T1. So the fact that it was hyper-intense on T1 is, uh, is concerning. Um, and in addition, this CF CSF cytology was normal. And so here we go. Um, so on T1, you can see the hyperintensity of this uh, optic nerve sheath tumor kind of going along the length of it. Um, and you don't really see it as well on the T2 or the uh, STIR, but you can also see it here uh, on the T1 with contrast. So uh, optic nerve biopsy and fenestration was performed. And very interestingly, the surgical pathology revealed malignant melanoma with immunohistochemical staining against MART1 and HN45, um, which was consistent with the patient's previous diagnosis of malignant melanoma of her right breast. Um, and this patient <coughs> was going to get CyberKnife due to the, uh, the single MET in the frontal lobe. However, um, a follow-up MRI revealed multiple METs, and she subsequently re received whole brain radiation. Uh, and then six months later, uh, after her whole brain radiation, she was no light perception OS, although the hemorrhages and the venous, venous stasis had resolved. 
just, just a couple final thoughts. Um, so he, this is her OCT before, which I showed you earlier, and then after the optic nerve fenestration. So this correlates with Dr. Sibony's um, theories uh, about the deflection of the RPE as a representation of a translaminar pressure, um, e and it's either caused by intracranial hypertension of papilledema, or as seen uh, in the optic nerve sheath meningiomas, or in this patient, the um, metastatic melanoma to the optic nerve, um, that you can actually see, see this deflection regardless of whether it's a local pressure or uh, intracranial pressure. And then with um, a release of that pressure through optic nerve fenestration, you see a return to the normal um, V-shape that's directed away from the vitreous. Um, and so this, this case exemplifies the utility of recognizing the peripapillary RPE deformation in the detection of infiltrating optic nerve sheath tumors presenting with CRVO and or disc edema, and especially in a patient with a history of uh, malignant disease. And that's the thing, we haven't really looked at that yet. Um, and as, uh, as I kind of talked about, when in the study with the presumed optic nerve sheath meningiomas, there was a gradient um, depending on, where on, on the size of the tumor and where the tumor was um, in reference to the globe, um, the, one, the one tumor was missed. So there really isn't, I think perhaps more studies need to be done to kind of find a threshold. Um, but especially in a patient with um, a CR CRVO with stage five disc edema in addition to the, you know, any kind of risks including um, like a history of cancer I think warrants um, you know, looking. They have, they have not, that's very interesting. That's a, that's a very interesting thought. Uh, yeah, I know he looked at the anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, um, and you know that and that showed that has the significant disc edema as well, um, but no pressure, and so and so that the the AION you know had the re had the regular um, RPE look, but I'm not sure he has. I don't think he's looked at um, optic neuritis specifically. Okay, I'll let him. I'll let him know. <laughs> All right. That was very good. Okay. In your patients with the nerve sheath meningioma, do you all of those patients have optic nerve swelling? I mean, you, you had an image of most uh -huh. people that had optic nerve sheath meningioma. 
They all, they all had disc edema. They all had, they had disc edema. edema, yeah. That was one of the criteria. Okay. Um, other questions? I think they, they only included, at least in that study, they included the patients with disc edema. I don't know if, if they saw ones without it or not. I'm not sure. Um, I wasn't involved in that study per se. Okay. Thank you. Oh my God, it feels amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, you too, man. You too. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, nice to meet you. I actually saw that.